Good morning, Believer's Fellowship. It's time to praise the Lord. A grand and glorious day is made for us. If you would stand to your feet and let's do it. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in a song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for oh, Your grace is enough, and your grace is enough, and your grace is enough for me, for me. Amen. His where we be without God's grace. My goodness. Yep. Seek you. I will seek you. 
be seated. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Amen, amen. Welcome to Believers Fellowship. I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you could do me a favor, you could everybody get your phone out, make sure it's on silent for us, please. I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. I want to welcome our first-time visitors here. Um, we used to before COVID, and we're trying to bring it back, but before COVID, we used to do a walk around and greet all the new visitors and everything like that. So if you're sitting by somebody that's new or somebody that looks new to you, uh, why don't you go ahead and do the hello, you wave, and just thank them for being here. Let's give them a round of applause for being here this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. If you're joining us online, thank you so much for joining us online this morning. Thank you for choosing Believers Fellowship to worship with. Um, this is your first, first time here in person or online. If you're here for your first time online or in person, there's a welcome card in the seat back in front of you. It looks like this, and it says welcome. I'd ask that you fill this out at the end of the service. I'd love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. We'll meet you outside in the foyer my left as you exit. If you're joining us online, if you visit our website, bfchurch.com, you can click on the guest tab, fill out that short survey, and we'll get in contact with you. If you have any prayer requests, that welcome card does the same thing. Please drop that in the offering receptacle. We'll make, be sure to pray over it. It is our honor and privilege to stand with you in prayer. Uh, we do have one announcement that we're going to go ahead and do now, so I'm going to ask Pastor Matt to come up. We had VBS on Friday, so he's going to kind of give you the rundown and the recap of what happened. Yeah, so we had our very first one-day VBS. In the past, we've always done the week long like everybody else, but you know, we didn't want to do a week just because that's what everybody else does, and that's because what we've always done. We want to do something different. We want to be very intentional. So we did a one-day VBS. I would say it was, it was pretty successful. It was incredible. We had a good, uh, yes. We had a good group of kids. We had a great group of, of leaders and helpers. And one thing that I noticed uh, as I, and all the leaders really had their own experience, but as I went around talking to the kids, I found that a lot of the kids, I'd say at least 60% of them, all said the same thing, that they don't know where they're going to end up after this life. And so I'd ask that you guys join me in your time in prayer, praying for those kids as we continue to call, as we continue to make home visits, as we continue to reach out to them and share the gospel with them beyond this one day. So thank you guys so much for your support, for your prayers, because it, it really was an incredible time. And, and we're looking for the future and what we can do next. So thank you guys so much. I'd also like to thank all the leaders, volunteers, those that took of their time to come up. Uh, they got here as early as 7 o'clock on Friday and just throughout the week, just uh, preparing for kids to, to come on Friday. So just thank you so much to Karen and, and Miss, uh, uh, who else was it? It was Karen. It was, all, it was 
Marina, it was Cheryl, it was Nathan, it was Henry. It was like the youth group from 10 years ago came back and they all helped out. And so thank you so much for, you know, just thank you everything that y'all did. John was here, uh, he, he taught the kids and so they just had a great time there. Of course, there was water day, so there was a slide and all that other stuff. But the main point was that message. And, and we're hoping that through follow-ups that we can continue just to, to pour into these kids, amen. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna, Ask Miss Jane to come up. She's going to do today's scripture reading. So I'd ask that you stand as we honor the Lord with the reading of his word. And may God bless the reading of his word to our hearts this morning. I'll be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 10 to 22. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying... I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from, me, from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul. And it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Wait, let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Is it not true, though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission, and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil, and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission on which the Lord sent me and have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choices of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Amen. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Amen. Let us bow our heads and pray. O most holy God, we humbly come before your throne of grace to praise you, for you are the one true God, the almighty living God, the one who was and is to come. We thank you for the privilege and freedom to gather together and worship you. We thank you for your word that is alive and powerful. To put the words of a song in prayer, please let your words speak. Will you let it pour down like rain, washing our eyes to see your majesty, that we may be still and know that you're in this place. Please let us stay and rest in your holiness. Please help us to find ourselves in the midst of you, beyond the music, beyond the noise. For all that we need is to be with you, and in the quiet, hear your voice. So we ask that you please let your word speak through your servant this morning. You declared in the book of Amos that the days are coming when you will send a famine, not of food or thirst of water, but a famine of hearing your word. Let us heed your warning today, O oh God. Please let your word speak to our hearts and move us to follow your decrees and be careful to keep your commands. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Please remain standing. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds 
by his wounds we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. We are healed by your sacrifice in the life that you gave. We are healed for you paid the price by your grace. We are saved. We are saved. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. We are healed by your sacrifice and the life that you gave. We are healed for you paid the price by your grace. We are saved. We are saved. He was pierced for our trip.
You may be seated. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you today. Glad you're here to worship with us online or in present, however you got here. I'm glad you are here. Amen. It's good to see you. Uh, talking about spontaneous victory today. Uh, that's not like a spontaneous combustion, but it ought to be similar to that. Uh, as we talk about victory, I was uh, this week, uh, so many people, you know, they, we sing about victory. We sing, put victory in our songs. We like those victory scriptures. But how often do so many people kind of go from a little victory here to a little victory here, and they're missing some real consistency in their spiritual life. Now, much of that's understandable as a young, young Christian. I mean, we're just kind of feeling our way along trying to get through it. But as we get older in the Lord, there ought to be more consistency. You know, I've, I've used the illustration before like a pinball. Uh, most people, that's kind of the experience of their Christian life. They, they're off one bumper, off another bumper, reacting to this, reacting to that, and, you know, come back and then cry and then get right and go back off and hit another bumper. And it just, it's all over the board. Uh, uh, one preacher from me used to call it a basketball relationship. And he said, you up and down and up and down and up and down. Hey, there's going to be downs. We're not perfect. We're not going to be perfect till we're made perfect. Amen. Uh, James said we all stumble in many ways. But, hey, here's the thing about it. There ought to be further distances, at least the dribble not, not be as high as it is every time of going up and down, that there ought to be some consistencies that are working in our life. Uh, Jane read a while ago from 1 Samuel 15 about Saul, and he is certainly a tremendous picture of this kind of individual who just up and down and never had any consistency. He would be a real field study case for psychiatrists today. I'm sure you'd have a, he'd, he'd be bearing all the labels from narcissist to schizophrenic, you know, psychosis to paranoia, schizophrenia from, you know, uh, polar, uh, all the other adjectives and terms I like to describe with the culture today. Uh, those, you know, let me, let me just say this, all right, there's a biblical definition for those things as well. And many of those things are, can be healed by grace and mercy from the Spirit of God. Uh, yeah, there are some things that you, you may have to deal with in life. God gives mercy and he gives grace. And especially what God does for every child of God is that he does give us victory. I don't know how familiar you are with King Saul in this story. I think most everybody knows a little bit about this particular story. He was told to go destroy the Amalekites, remember? Utterly destroy was the word that was used in the language uh, there uh, to him very clearly. Destroy everything. Now, for those who say, oh, you know, God just killed the indigenous people kind of thing. Let me just back off this for a moment, all right? And let me tell you, uh, the sovereignty of God over the nations, I will never understand. That's God's business. God says in Jeremiah, when I want to lift up a nation, I'll lift one up, and I want to put one down, I'll put it down, all right? But here's a situation where the Amalekites come uh, up in, in this scenario. God had already told the Amalekites many years before this that judgment was coming their way. And they ignored it. Why, why, why such harsh judgment against the Amalekites? When the children of Israel left in the Exodus, leaving Egypt, I remember the Red Sea experience, and as they began to journey across, heads toward, heading towards Canaan, the very first group of people that sought to hinder them from going any further, you know, basically the, the group that tried to keep them out of the will of God and stop them in their tracks was the Amalekites. And there, was, there were battles fought with the Amalekites. And God told them that judgment's going to be coming. And now it's time for that cup of judgment basically is full. And it's getting ready to be poured out. And God's going to use Saul and, and his army to carry out this particular judgment. And uh, so the reasoning behind that, if you study a little bit of your Bible, you see it's because they're trying to hinder what God's doing. And the sought to hinder what God's doing. Now, if you're looking for Old Testament types and symbols, because we like to find those in the Old Testament and bring them into the New Testament, if you really want a good type, you know, of the enemies of God, we, we described them in threefold before, right? The world, the flesh, the devil. The Amalekites really represent, more than any other group in that whole process, is our own flesh. 
Because our flesh is usually the first one who seeks to oppose God. That's, we're just naturally sinners, right? We're born sinners. And until we're born again, there's no hope over the old man and over the old flesh and over the old life. But just because you come to Christ doesn't mean that the old man, the old nature, the flesh, the Amalekite in us, is not going to try to stop what God's up to. And we have enough hindrance from the devil and from the world itself which opposes God, but we also have this internal foe, you know, ourselves. And we have to be careful. That's why Paul said, I die daily. So the Amalekites must face death, and it is the same in our life. This old man must die. We take him to the cross every day, and we find our victory in Christ Jesus. But as long as we're alive, we're going to contend with that old nature until Christ transforms us completely, all right, and we are glorified in our body and our nature, and everything else has changed. But as we look towards our Christian life here and now, there are conflicts and there are battles, but yet victory should be a constant in the spiritual Christian's life for the most part. I use this synonym spontaneous, uh, intentionally, because it is a word which means to be instinctive or unrehearsed in something or unplanned or free in something. In other words, something happens before us and we, as we've grown in the Lord, we've learned now to begin our day and to walk in the Spirit daily. That, that should be an understood clear response, you know. Even the Scripture says in James, with every temptation there's a way of escape. In other words, so whenever you're tempted, there's a clear way given. And it's the way of victory, it's the path of freedom, and it's, it's the yielding of your heart and your life to the Holy Spirit at this particular juncture of your day and of your life. And so you, you move that. It's really just this context of being filled with the Spirit so that we are not so reactionary to everything like the bumper, uh, you know, the pinball machine mentality and, and picture of things. So there's this instinctive thing that we've now, are, because of the Holy Spirit's presence, has begun to choose the Lord Jesus Christ more and more and more as we grow with Christ. Now, a little background story about the Amalekites I told you, but with Saul, God, remember, if you remember the story, God really wasn't interested in giving the children of Israel a king. But they whined and they complained, and so he finally gave them a king. And he picks out Saul of all the children, all the sons of Israel. He brings out, he brings out Saul and anoints him to be king. From the very beginning, Saul was a guy who had issues, all right, with following the Lord completely. And before this, a few chapters before this, I think it's in chapter 13, you know, there'd been this battle with, with Philistines and at Gilgal. He was told to wait there by the prophet of God and by the word of God. Here's what God's telling you, Saul. Get up there and wait, all right? And Samuel will come when it's time, make a sacrifice and offering, speak a blessing over the tribes of Israel, and they'll go into battle and have the victory. But as they're waiting, Saul begins to get antsy, impatient, doesn't want to wait to do what God says. In fact, as he looks around, the people begin to see the Philistines collect their armies and things are looking bad, you know, and a group shows up over there and another group of people show up to fight, another group of people show up to fight, and, you know, the people are getting a little worried and wondering and disheartened about things. And so Saul says, I'm not going to wait anymore. I'm just going to, I'm going to do an offering. And he does the offering. As soon as the fire dies, Samuel shows up. Isn't that the way it works? <laughs> if we just waited, if we'd just been patient, we know the Lord has promised to come through, but too many people want God to come through, believe God will come through, but they want him to come through on their schedule. Well, that's not the way it happens. And Saul moves and inappropriately and impatiently under the stress and the, uh, and the pressure. says, you know, I wanted to encourage the people. Things were getting, they're getting disheartened, and, you know, it was a mess. And now he, here he is with the war with the Amalekites, and he chooses to do it again. Whatever he wants to do, he knows what the Lord has said, but yet he's just moving impatiently, prematurely. He's moving uh, presumptuously, I think, at this point. We'll, we'll see in a moment a little bit more when we go back to that scripture. But the overview just leads us to understand that here's a guy who's definitely not walking according to the word of God in his life. You say, well, pastor, you know, I, 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 I desire and long to see, you know, this victory more spontaneous in my life where it becomes more instinctive in my life. Where, I mean, I, I see that reality of God's promise, but then I look over here where I am, and man, there's like this canyon between that reality and my reality. You know, where, where is it? Well, I'm so glad you asked because that's what we're talking about today. And as we look at it, you know, the simple principle for spontaneous victory, and you've probably heard this a million times from me, is that we simply learn how to heed the word of the Lord. I didn't say hear. I said heed. And there's a big difference. In fact, we've talked about that, the word, uh, when the God says to, to, the, to us in Scripture to listen, 
that it's, it's, the, it's the implication of the word is not just to hear something, it's to listen so as to do. That means to heed the word of the Lord. And there's a lot of people who are willing to hear what God says, but it's another completely whole different kind of animal when it comes down to heeding the word of the Lord. And the key to really walking in victory as a Christian, I guess they have this simple thing. We say, I'm going to hear what God says and do what God says. I'm going to walk that way. In 1 Samuel 15, that passage there, it says, And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people and over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. That was his, that was his one thing to do as the king. You're the king. Here's what you're going to do. Here's the, what, what do you, what's the king stuff? Where's the job description? Here it is. Listen to the word of the Lord. That's it? That's it. But what about don't have to practice king stuff? Learn the king rules? No, you just listen to what God said. And it's the same thing in your Christian life. Uh, for the brand new Christian, what do I do? Listen to what God says and do it. Heed the word of the Lord. Well, Brother Joe, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian a long time. I've learned to walk with God in a lot of ways. But, you know, i got this dilemma now, and i got a situation. I have a circumstance. Hey, heed the word of the Lord. Hear what God says so as to do what God says, so as not to bring it up for your personal estimation or your personal opinion, but just to heed the word of the Lord. Let me give you three real simple truths that I call it, followed by three jewels to what really means to worship God with this spirit of, of, of transparency and honesty and truth, which is, I think, heartbeat of what real obedience is anyway. Truth number one is that there's no real victory without real obedience. No real victory without real obedience. And I use the word real obedience because there's, there's a, there seems to be an attitude uh, called solitis, you know, that sets into our hearts that says, <clears throat> I'll hear the word, but let me determine what that means to me. I'll translate to, how, to how, how I will respond to that, my personal self. This is obviously what Saul had. And it's recognized by self-deception because this is where he just deceives himself. As we read a while ago, Samuel comes back. He keeps the king alive, doesn't kill him like he was supposed to. The animals are there. The best of the animals, the finest of the stock, it wasn't killed like they were supposed to. And here comes Samuel. And before Samuel can say, Shalom, Saul speaks up and he says, <coughs> I've, I've done the word of the Lord. It's usually guilty conscience that responds like that, man. <coughs> Excuse me. I've done what the Lord said, but he hadn't. His confession is a lie. And, and, and obviously, you know, it, it, these manifestation of his lies is there with the animals bleeding and lowing and all those stuff that's going on. But he just deceives himself. And this is the worst thing about deception is that it's when, it's a, when it's a matter of choosing to, 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 to disobey, the obvious fruit of that is always self-deception. But it's also, just look at his compromise. And by compromise, I mean that he partially does. And he goes about and does some of what God says, but he doesn't do all that God says. And I think that's where the church and where Christians so, uh, so commonly fail and so commonly lose a, a position of victory in their own life. He, he presumed a lot of stuff, and if you follow the story, in some translations, it, he's talking about the people and the sacrifice. It shows, you know, that it's so willingly disobedient. But one translation, is, 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 uh, when Samuel's correcting, he says, you know, that uh, sa obedience is better than sacrifice, you know, and then he used, he used another word, he said, and it's better than presumption in one translation. You presume this is what God wants, all right? You, you didn't do what you should have done. You just took it upon yourself to do something else. And if you look at this, you see this, uh, this self-deception, you see this self-protection because first thing he does when he gets around to explaining it is, he said, well, I did what the Lord commanded me to do. He says it again later even though he did not. And twice he says, the people. People did this. You're the king of the people. <laughs> the king is to give the leadership from the Lord, tell the people what's right, what's wrong. And he said, but all they, and, and, and they had good reasons, he tells them. They saved them for a sacrifice. They saved it for an offering for, he used this word, you'll see a couple of times, your God. Doesn't say our God. It's your God. 
And he says, well, you know, we were going to do this as a, as a sacrifice, and, and it's the best, you know, it's the fatted calves, it's the best of the sheep, you know, it's the best of the oxen, and we were going to make this as a sacrifice. You see Samuel just, just moving. Verse 15, he says, and Samuel said they have bought, they, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the, the people, spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. Well, why'd they do that? They were told not to do it. Oh, they did it to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And then he flips it. He says, but we, he includes himself now, we utterly destroyed everything God said to do. But he didn't. He didn't do what God told him to do. He just, he just lying and continuing to lie. He kind of goes to this partial excuse of what he did do and blames the rest of it on the people. But here's the problem, you know. Uh, God didn't tell them to do that, even though they decided they would do that. And even if it's true, if, they really, if he's not lying about the fact they wanted to present this as a sacrifice to the Lord, God had already given them a clear instruction not to do that. In fact, when he uses the word to utterly destroy these things that he told them, if you look that up in your Hebrew dictionary, that word, those two words, utterly destroyed, it is a word which means to dedicate something to God, and it's to be used for nothing else, but it's to be done the dedication to God is to be done the way that God wants the dedication done. You don't take what God gives you and decide what you think is the best way to do with it. Hello, did he say that? You don't take what God has placed in your life and in your heart and in your hands and do with it what you think needs to be done with it. You don't, you don't take what God's placed in your hands and given you and do it the way you want to do with it. Amen. You do what the Lord says to do with it. Yeah. And that's, that's all, oh, that sounds really good. But it's really smart if you do it that way. <laughs> right? It not only gets real good, it gets real smart. And I'll talk about that in, in a little bit more what that, what that means. But, hey, there's no real victory without real obedience in your life. And real obedience is just doing what the Lord has said to do. So, okay, I'm doing what the Lord said do. Well, if you are doing what the Lord said do, it'll be obvious. You say, what do you mean? I've done what the Lord said, Samuel. If you, what's that? Well, what is that? Oh, that? The people did that. They did that for God. You know, it's amazing how many things we can do for God that God has nothing to do with. Ain't that the truth? I'm going to do this for the Lord. God didn't want you to do that. Well, I think this is what God wants. Well, is it what God said? Well, I just think this is what God wants. No, but is that what God said? If it's not what God said, don't waste your time with it. What I'm saying is that if there is obedience, there'll be a manifestation in my Christian life when I'm, when I'm obedient to the Lord and I'm really loving God in that day-to-day -day relationship that God's called me to do it. You know what? There's a manifestation. It's not, it's, it's, it's not a manifestation of disobedience. It's a manifestation of obedience. You say, what is it? Well, the, the, the manifestation of the Spirit of God in my life is peace and joy and love and kindness and temperance and self-control and patience. Hello? Yeah. Amen. See, well, I got some of that. When the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit, it uses it as a singular verb. It doesn't say the fruit of the Spirit are. It says the fruit of the Spirit. And so all that, you can't say, well, I've got this and that. No, that's all, it's all in there. If you don't have patience, just because you're not walking in the Spirit. I say, well, Lord, give me patience. I don't want to pray, Lord, give me patience. He already gave you patience. When you receive the Holy Spirit, with that came the patience package. All right? You, didn't, you don't get it in portions. You know, well, you know, I, I want the vacation deluxe package, you know, or I want the car with the XL package or whatever. Hey, you got the XL package. You got the luxury package when you got Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And for you to wimp around and say, well, I just don't have any patience for that, is to say, you know, I don't, I'm not allowing God to work there in my life. Right? I'm just not allowed. I don't want to let God. I'd rather blow my head and steam off. You know, I'd rather act foolish than act like a wife. Yes, God's given us what we need. But yet, we come to this place again, we start this kind of self-determination. Romans 6, we shared this passage last week in Romans 6. We talked about, you know, when you come to the Lord and what God does in our life and the old life, we're ashamed of that. And the new life, we're, 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 we glory in Christ. He said, do you not know, in verse 16 of 6, he says, do you not know when you present yourself for someone as a slave for obedience, you are the slave of the one whom you obey? He said, that here's the way it works. It's either if you're, if you're in sin, it, it results in death. If you're in obedience, he said, that results in righteousness. All right? 
So there's a manifestation. We're either walking in his righteousness, enjoying the fruit of the Spirit in our life, or we're just be disobedient. It's this idea of kind of a, that spontaneous reaction happens. It's like if, if I get up here today and I have a lemon in my hand, and I cut it in half, and I squeeze both halves as hard as I can, what am I going to get? Lemon juice, right? I'm not going to get apple juice out of that because it's not an apple. I'm not going to get pineapple juice out of it. It's not a pineapple. I'm going to get lemon juice. That's the natural manifestation of the lemon is lemon juice. When you get squeezed, what comes out? <laughs> Whatever you're full of. <laughs> we'll put it that way, amen. Whatever you're filled with, that's what comes out. But if we're walking in the Spirit, guess what comes out, all right? It's what's inside. James put it this way. He said, listen, does a fountain send the same opening, both fresh and bitter water? Does a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? No, nor can salt water produce fresh. And the only way that fresh water can come out of me or you is if I'm walking in the Spirit. There's just that, that gracious manifestation of Jesus and his love and his grace and his mercy. And I can tell real quick that way when I'm not walking in the Spirit. There's the very telltale signs and telltale odor of the old man rotting in his stench. Amen? So truth number one, victory is going to come from real obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you do that, then victory flows. Truth number two, victory comes from the Lord. You say, well, in 1 Corinthians it says, you know, thanks be to God who gives us the victory. He does what? Who, who what? Who what? Thanks be to God who? Try it again. Thanks be to God who? Gives us the victory. Doesn't say I have to work for it. Doesn't say I have to be a good boy for it. Doesn't say I have to, you know, try real hard for it. Doesn't say I have to do certain sacrifices for it. God gives us the victory. It doesn't come from other things in other ways. And, and this story is real clear, with, with, especially with Saul. It doesn't come from physical attributes, talent, cheers, you know, uh, charisma, charm, ex experiences. 1 Samuel 9, 2, this is an abbreviation from verses 1 and 2. I'll read you the whole verses. Kish was a wealthy man, so he's got the cash to start with, all right? <coughs> Who belonged to the tribe of Benjamin, and his father was Ebiel, his grandfather Zeror, his great-grandfather was Bacharoth, and his great-great-grandfather was Aphia, Kish had a son named Saul, who's a head taller than anyone else in Israel, and good looking. That sounded like date qualifications for some girls. <coughs> He's good looking, best looking guy in town. He's wealthy. He's taller than everybody else. Certainly, he's our candidate. Certainly, he's the guy on the platform. Certainly, he's the guy to be king because he has all these things. But all these things don't bring life. They don't bring life. That's why God's hadn't chosen many mighty. He's chosen the weak to confound the, the strong. And so Saul is a perfect picture of that person who's just got everything going for him in a physical sense <coughs> but has nothing going for him in a spiritual sense. Also, not only is that, that true, the past spiritual experiences, this can be dangerous. First Samuel talks about that it happened when, when he turned back to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. This is way up in chapter 10, and God changed his heart. And those signs came battle on that day. When they came to the hill there, a the older group of prophets met him. Catch this. And the Spirit of God came mightily upon Saul, and he prophesied among them. He had a great experience with God, but that's not where the victory comes from. Doesn't come from my talent, doesn't come from my personality, doesn't come from wit and charm, it doesn't come from past experiences, physical or spiritually the one. I know a lot of people have great, some, had some marvelous experiences in their spiritual life. And you can see they fall right into the pride of that. Remember what Paul said? I was, he said, I know a man caught in the third heaven, saw marvelous things too wonderful to speak. And what, God, and what happens next? He said, and that same man, which was him, uh, God put a thorn in his flesh to keep him from being exalted above measure. Because spiritual experience can, can do that to us. Well, I had this, or I do this, or I've got this spiritual gift, or I've had that spiritual experience. Oh, you haven't. Well, you're not as spiritual as I am. 
No, that's not where victory comes from. Victory comes from the Lord. It's a gift from God. And praise God if you've had experiences, but that's not the measure of your maturity. And the more that you brag about your spiritual experience, it shows, that you're, it shows you how immature you've really become. Or that you think that there's a grading system with God like that. Well, you had the experience. I didn't have the experience, so I'm better than you. That's a dangerous place to go in your spiritual walk in life. And Saul, he's, and, and I think this becomes one of Saul's problems because now he's out there offering offerings he shouldn't be in. He's doing the work of the, the priesthood that he shouldn't be doing. He's doing the work of the prophets that he's not supposed to be doing. And he's just, you know, he's been given an office, but he wants to fill all of them. <laughs> And it just becomes a disaster. And there is no victory in our life when we try to do the same thing, thing spiritually. So victory comes from the Lord. The third truth here is pretty simple as well. Truth number three, victory flows from genuine worship in spirit and truth. Now, this becomes a lifestyle to us. Victory will flow from our walk with God. And as you look at, at Saul's life, you see him in, in a situation that he's more concerned about people and things and what do they think and what will they say because he often goes back to the same excuse well what would the people think you know i'm supposed to be the king i'm supposed to look good most things still urge and people so i'll do these other things he's off doing everything he should not be doing and arrogance has come into his heart and now he's not worshiping god there's no worship of the of, 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 of in fact every reference to god in this is always comes with not our god it's your god there's no personal fellowship that's happening no personal practicing god's presence in his life it's just you know he's just so worried about what people think say and do and performing right and looking right and being right he just keeps missing the mark the people came and offering god didn't ask that for an offering he's just going to go right along with it whether he instigated or they instigated i don't know could be either way but the deal is he's just giving way to whatever they want if you want to experience this, this kind of Walking with God in a, in a state of victory, then it's not going to come from those elements of your personality, those elements of your past experiences. It's going to be when you learn how to really walk with God in a personal relationship. And until that takes place in your walk in life, then you're not going to really experience the joy of what Christianity is supposed to be. You'll get into this religious performance kind of thing, and did I do X, Y, and Z? Make sure I did it today, and if I didn't, well, I did X, and I did Y, so that's good enough, and whatever it might be in your life. Paul warns about this in Scripture in 1 Corinthians. He's writing to the Corinthian church, and he's telling them, you know, hey, you can do a lot of stuff for God, but, you know, if it's not from God, it's not what God wanted, then you're just wasting your time. Right? He says, you're just wasting your time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there, there's several verses, but let me, let me just give you the breakdown starting in verse 13. Every man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of every man's work of what sort it is. In other words, the Bible says that every Christian, you know, should understand that there's a day of reckoning even for us as children of God. That God's Son shed his blood for us, died on the cross for us, not so that we could just kind of say, oh, I want to be saved and go and live in the way we've always lived, the same attitude, the same, same unholy living. And he says, we're going to be held accountable. Now, salvation is by grace, all right? So when I do stand before this moment of accounting, it's not if I'm going to get in heaven or not get into heaven. I'm going to get in heaven because of the blood of Jesus, because I trusted him as my Savior. But it's what did I do with what he gave me? Was I like a Saul who just kind of, kind of, went at it with his own mindset and his own ideas and his own plan and said, I know what God said, but, you know, this is what I'd rather do and this is the way I think it should be and I know what God said, but it's kind of like when God said, I want you to utterly destroy the Amalekites. That is a word which means a dedication, which means he bans doing anything else from it. Saul's response is just so messed up. He said in verse 13, and Saul came to Saul and said to him, blessed be the Lord, but I've carried out the command of the Lord. Well, what about this manifestation? Verse 15. Oh, those people brought them from the Amalekites, and they spared the best, the best sheep, and they have going to make a sacrifice to the Lord God. But the rest we utterly destroyed. We are so prone to treat God the same way. God didn't want the people to do that. He didn't ask them to do that. It was clear he already told them what to do with everything and how to handle everything, but yet Saul spares this King Agag, and the people come back, and they didn't bring, they, they kept the best of the spoils for, I really just believe, for themselves, and they didn't get rid of them. And here they are. And so often that we find ourselves in the same kind of situation, God says, okay, Joe, this is what I want you to do. Or Gary or Bill or Sam or Sue or whoever you might be. He just lays out clear what his will is for your life, and we approach it like, well, <clears throat> I know what God said. 
And I'm going to do that up to this spot. Up, up to this place. I, I'll do what the Lord wants this far. We just assume that that's acceptable. We just presume that that'll be okay. When it's not okay at all. That I think that, well, I know what the Lord said, but you know, if I did it this way, it was not going to cost me as much. If I do it this way, it, it, it's easier for me to do it this way. Or this is what I think it ought to be. What happens here? We're, we're using our, our own mind, our own understanding. When God has clearly given us a, a real clear word on something, and we just think we're just going to handle it in a completely different way because we, we have some extenuating circumstances. And that's the way it works. There's always extenuating circumstances. There's this guy, I, I, I know he cheated on his wife, but she hadn't been nice to him. I know she cheated on her husband, but hey, but everybody's doing that today. Everybody, I mean, come on. I heard Pastor so and so did that. So I mean, just, it, it, that happened. No. Let's get a little more familiar. God told me he wanted something from me. Okay, God, I'll give that. But I don't want to give it that way. I want to give it my way. God told me to, uh, you know, go to church. Okay, I'll go to church. But he says faithfully. But let me define faithfully. I think being faithful in church is at least being there once a month. I'm faithful. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Oh, I'm, I'm going to give to the Lord when I have more to give. The Bible says we just give first fruits, that's it. Amen. Whatever I've got this week is, is, is in my hands. The Lord's blessed me with that. I'll just give off that. Let's just make it simple, doesn't it? Just give first fruits. And he defines it. But we, I don't like first fruits. I don't have a lot of money. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the Lord... Uh, I'm going to give the Lord my presence, not my presence, <laughs> but my presence. I'll be there. And that, that's, that's good. Or I'll give the Lord my talent, but not all my talent. <laughs> I'm going to give the Lord this. It's just the same thing. It's that whole mindset, you know. I, I, I don't like church the way, it's, the, way the, the way the Bible describes it. I want church to be like the way I, you know, and we got country songs. That's my church. Well, that's real sweet, but that ain't his church, you know. We've got to get to his church and not sit around defining it like I think, well, I think there's just a lot of open space here, no. Well, the Bible talks about pastors and teachers and shepherds and, and gifts of the Spirit operating in the body of Christ and people function together as one organism, not you out by yourself in the middle of the lake. Well, that's my church. Well, I'd quit that one and get into Jesus's. I'm just getting real quiet. So what am I saying here? The Bible talks about what is an acceptable offering. Do you know that? What are, what are acceptable offerings? And those are the ones that God says bring. But we have people today who are not interested in bringing what God wants. Or we just overdo something else to make up for what we didn't do over there. And, and you know that's possible. Well, I don't do that, but I do this a lot. <laughs> and God understands. Let me, let me read that, how this worked out in Isaiah chapter 1. And God understood. Hear the word of the Lord. This is chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. And give ear the instructions, you people of Gomorrah. <clears throat> what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? Now, you're giving extra stuff, says the Lord. I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams, the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of the bulls, the lambs, and the goats when you come to appear before me. Who requires of you this trampling of my court? So as they just, they're doing all this other stuff overtly but not doing what they should be doing. Why? Because guilty conscience causes us to do that. But we wouldn't have a guilty conscience if we just do what he said. And so we want to do makeup work. He said, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon, Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals. Yeah, I hate your appointed feasts. They become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Yes, even though you multiply, you pray more. I'm not listening. Because your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil from your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. 
learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Basically saying, you don't love me and you don't love others. And you're just doing all this to make a big show to cover up for what you haven't done. He said, your hearts are not right, your lives are not right, your worship is all wrong. Oh, they're worshiping, but it was on their terms. And that, I know this is strong stuff, but this is where victory will lie at the heart of your life and you'll experience the truth of victory in your life. We say, hey, I'm just, how about we just do this God's way? You know, Paul wrote the church to Colossians. He says, hey, don't be removed from the simplicity of, that's in Jesus Christ. You know, it's not about adding this and adding that. And boy, I want you to know we're all good at, you know, at Jesus plus, but we don't need Jesus plus. We just need to do what God's called us to, live the way he's called us to, get back to the simplicity of loving God, loving people, and reaching the world. Amen? Simplicity of just loving people as we love ourselves. This is, this is, this is where, where we get going wrong, though. It's like, so, well, we're going to do it this way, and, you know, I did this, and we're going to do this, and, you know. And Samuel turns away from Saul. Samuel reach, Saul reaches out to grab his garment to stop him and tears his garment, a piece of the garment off. Samuel looked at him and said, just as you've torn this, God's torn the kingdom from your hand today. Now, he stayed in office for quite some time after that, but there was no power. And you see his life just going berserk. He's trying to kill his own son. He tries to kill David. Nobody trusts him anymore. I mean, he's a mess mentally, emotionally, spiritually. He's all twisted around because he simply wouldn't heed the word of the Lord. Just gets back to just loving. And that's what genuine worship is, though. That's a lifestyle. What, what is the acceptable offering for us? The Bible says the acceptable offering starts first and foremost. Romans chapter 1, present yourselves as a living sacrifice. All right? Just saying, I'm, I'm here to live for Christ is what that means. Life is Christ. To, to, to die is gain, to live is Christ. I'm going to live for the Lord today. This is your reasonable spiritual service in words. Present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. So what's the Lord want for you? Get on the altar and love God. Get serious about just, you know, loving the Lord. And you know what? This is the amazing part. It's, it's, it's a difference. Here's the difference. People are living their lives, and they're like a tree that's rooted, all right? And they spend most of their life trying to prune this tree, saw limbs off this tree. I'm going to stop this. I'm going to stop that. I'm going to stop that. I'll start this. I'm going to begin this. Well, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'll do this some more. Well, I'll do well, I'll do that. Well, I'll do this. And they're just, you know, it's kind of pruning the tree all the time. All right? And, and what God said is, hey, go plant yourself in me, and you'll bear good fruit. I'll take care of the trimming. And what did Jesus say? I mean, that many people stand before me that day, and they'll say, but Lord, did not we do this in your name? And we did this. And he said, I don't even know you. There's no real worship. There's no real experience. There's no walking with me, enjoying me, living with me, and, and, and enjoying the life of my presence in, in your life and, and, and the glory of it. You say, well, how do you, how do you have that experience? Well, it's pretty simple because there's three simple things I said I would conclude with, you know, that, that are the heartbeat of what genuine worship is. And the first is this. It's just surrender, and this is what Saul couldn't get. Just, when you get in the morning, what should you do? I get in the morning and say, you know, Lord, this is the day you've made. I'm just going to surrender you today. I can't do it without your power. I trust you and, and just begin to yield to him. You know, and what, you know what Saul surrendered to? He was so concerned about what he would, what, what would people think and what would people say and what would people do. He was so wrapped up with popular approval. But lest we condemn him, how many of our decisions fall in the same realm? How often are we just going, well, what will they think? What will they say? What will they do? That's not where you're going to find sustenance for your life. Jesus said, my meat, which means the thing that gives me life, the thing that sustains me, my meat is to do the will of my heavenly Father. That's just surrender. So I listen to hear what the Father says, and that's what I do. But you know, too many people, they can't get to this place of surrender. It, there, it, there's just too many stipulations they have in mind. Well, I'll go this far with God, and I'll give God that, but I'm not going to give him this. Or I'll tell God this, but I can't have that. You know, Look over your shoulder. Just take a quick glance back in the last few years. How good a job have you been doing as God of your own life? One day doing that personally in my own life, taking that kind of long look, I saw that I was really miserable as God. 
I did a bad job. And my, and my, my direction and the course of my life just kept me going deeper and deeper and deeper into trouble. So I had to come to the place of surrender. Okay, God, you're in charge. And listen, man, it's a lot easier with him in charge. Takes care of a lot of things I would worry about. But what if the economy goes bad? So what? God's in charge. But what, if, what if you lose your job? God's in charge. You know? But what about that? God's in charge. Well, what about that? God's in charge. Well, what if this happens? God's in charge. I've got some bad people around me. God's in charge. I've got some crazy people in my family. God's in charge. <laughs> He's got this. So I'm going to live with, you know, upset stomach all the time and headaches. Just turn that over to the Lord. He's got it. He's in charge. So it starts with this, this, this place of surrender, which leads us to the second place, which is we get helpless. In Psalms, and in, in Samuel, it, it said in verse 17 of that chapter, when Samuel was speaking to Saul, he said, Saul, when you were little in your own eyes, when you didn't have such a high estimation of yourself and a big opinion of yourself, he said, then God used you. And isn't that the same with any of us? But it's one thing that I surrender now, but now I need to know as I'm walking the path of surrender is that I, God doesn't need my help or your help. And if he did, it wouldn't help because I got nothing to offer. Remember that, that line in that song, who saved a wretch like me? Some people don't know what a wretch is. Well, you're looking at one. All right, look in the mirror, you'll find another. All right, I'm a mess without God. And if I get up today and say, I don't need God today, I'm going to do this for God, or just tell God, and go, hey, I've got this. I'll not only be a wretch, I'll be a wretched wreck wretch. <laughs> It'll be a wreck. I'll, I'll mess the whole day up. And so there comes this place where, 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 where even Jesus said this. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, I do nothing of myself. I, I trust the Father. So we have this attitude to help us. And the third thing, and this is a really important part of it, unless you don't understand this, is that faith, I really am looking to him for my strength. I really do have to look to him for the patience. I really do have to look to him for the grace. I have to look to him for, for the forgiveness to the person that's been maybe offended me in some way that I don't want to forgive them. Those are, I have to look to God, or, or I'll just try to struggle in my own flesh and never get there. So faith really means that I am, I'm trusting the Lord today. What am I trusting God for? Whatever comes down the pike, man. Whatever comes down the road, that's what I need to trust God for. And you know as well as I, things come down the road all the time, completely unexpected. <laughs> Amen? So what am I going to do? Ah! <laughs> no, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe God. In fact, I've, I've asked the question often of folks, so what do you believe in God for? In your life, what do, you, what do you trust the Lord with? Is it your marriage? Is it your home? Is it your life? Whatever. I mean, what are you trusting the Lord for? What are you holding on to God for? And say, if he don't come through, I'm sunk. And the truth of the matter, it ought to be everything. I think it was Manly Beasley who asked this hard question. It was a silly question, but it made the point. was, what if God died today? Seriously, what if God died today? Would it make any difference? Would you keep doing the same old thing you've been doing? Good news, he's not going to die. <laughs> he is life. But the point was the futility of trying to live our life without him. And coming to that place where we're just not in this place of understanding what real worship is, that, that I'm going I'm to love God today, believe God today, it, it just brings God on the scene. You know, that, that's what the Lord delights in. When you look at Scripture, that's what honors the Lord. That's what blesses the Lord. In fact, that's what he delights in. In fact, he told Samuel, uh, Samuel told Saul, hey, God doesn't delight in your burnt offerings. He delights in your obedience. Just in that, what, what motivates that obedience? It, it operates by love. What motivates faith? The Bible says faith operates by love in Hebrews and Galatians as well. Saul follows the story. Oh, oh, he's off. He feels bad. All right. He feels bad. He got caught. It's, he's, he's ashamed. And he says in verse 24, And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words because I feared the people. And I listened to their voice. I was more concerned what people think of me. Verse 30, I have sinned. says it again. Bold face underline the next part. But please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and go back with me that I can worship the Lord your God. In other words, 
okay, we've had a bad deal here. We need some good press. <laughs> we need a statement. We need some political correction to this mess I've made. And so it would really be good, as you've heard me confess my sin, if you go back with me now and let everybody see you standing beside me that, that you approve me now. So you see where his heart is, right? You got that right? That picture's real clear. He's so wrapped up in himself. If I've said it before, the person who's just wrapped up in the self comprises the smallest package known to mankind. <laughs> it's not worth wrapping yourself up in self. It's better to be wrapped up in the Lord. Yes. Now, I will reiterate myself this last time and I'll close. I do not preach these sermons to make you feel bad. <laughs> they make me feel bad enough preparing them. Because somebody said, uh, how do you know what to preach? I usually preach right where God's dealing with me. And speaking of my heart about it. Because I want to be genuine, authentic in worship. I don't want to stand on this stage and sing a song or say a word or pray a prayer. And it's all just really pretense. Because it won't mean a hill of beans with God. Preach these so we can stay on course. So we can be encouraged by the grace of God. Be motivated to take another step and go higher in our walk with God and further up the mountain in our climb to be all God's called us to be. But when I realize that I'm going the wrong direction, I'm going down that mountain instead of up that mountain, that's when God is so faithful to correct us and instruct us. And the Lord is so good at being specific with us. I mean, this is pretty broad all right this covers a lot of ground but isn't it amazing how god can just take a word from something that something said to to your heart and just plant something in your spirit about sometimes just multiple things yeah. he just has a way of making it clear that's the word you need to respond to which is basically why we give invitations by the way let's have an invitation so would you stand Can you just bring to your own heart and mind in this moment whatever that word was to you? I mean, what did the Lord say to you? I know the Lord spoke to me clearly when I, in, in preparation of, of several things, and I had to take them to the Lord. And I'll be honest with you, <laughs> lest you should think so, I'm not the nicest guy some of you might think. <laughs> I get angry, I get frustrated, you know? You know what? Maybe this way. I'm just like you. <laughs> We're all on the same ground. We're all moving towards the same eyes in Christ. Amen. Hopefully. But there are times that when the Lord has spoken to me very clear words, that there's two times of, of repentance that, that are necessary if I'm going to walk with God and go on with God. And if victory is going to be reality, because it is his gift to me, to be experienced by me. But the only way to do that is just to stay with that attitude of genuine spirit of worship in my heart is recognizing his presence in my life. So whatever the Lord said to you today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. To, this invitation is to invite you to come to this altar as a believer, should the Lord have said something to you, maybe bring someone, feel free to. If you want to pray with someone, Gary and I will be here. But just to come and lay it before the Lord. Maybe there's some other need you just want someone to pray with you about, come, we'll pray with you about it. If you're here and you've not yet given your heart to Christ, man, you're just spinning and going nowhere, you know. And you're going to have to stop and just deal with yourself first and realize that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. And his name is Jesus. And he died on the cross to save you. He rose from the dead to prove that the sacrifice for your sins was accepted by his Father and he's coming again. You need to be ready. And the only way to be ready is to open your life to him. And if you feel that calling and that tugging and that, that spirit of God moving your heart, you know what that is. That's God calling. You come, let us pray with you. Let us rejoice with you in the decision for you as you open your heart to Christ. Maybe you're looking for a church home you where the Lord is leading. Come, share it with Pastor Gary and myself. Say, hey, we're ready to follow the Lord and, and, and how the Lord's moving here at Believer's Fellowship. But as they sing, as you pray, as you sing, or as you come to the altar, as you feel led, whatever God's doing, let's do that and be open.
honor you. We praise you. We thank you for the grace that flows. Lord, forgive us 
as a people when we so often take your word and just manipulate it, Father, to our own design. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be humble, surrendered, teachable. May you be glorified in our lives, Lord, as we depart from these services today. May this week be one that we meet in your spirit and by the power of your spirit. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. say it a little louder. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You may be seated. He's got a couple of closing announcements, and we will be dismissed. Brother Gary, would you come? Amen. Just a couple of closing announcements again. Today at 3 o'clock, we're having our 201. So if you've gone through our 101 uh, membership class, next is our 201, which is Journey. That's today at 3 o'clock. There are sign-up sheets, our sign-up forms, either at the back table or out there in the foyer. Uh, let me know that you're going to be here. And again, it is today at 3 o'clock. Um, and this is our second class in our, in our uh, Journey classes. So this is 201. Uh, and then next, we don't forget our Wednesday night Bible studies, uh, both our men's and our women's uh, Bible studies. For the men, it's No More Excuses by Tony Evans. For the ladies, it is Esther. For the ladies' Bible study, there's two opportunities for you to be a part of that. It just started last week or a couple weeks ago, so you're not too far behind. But you can either um, join the ladies Tuesday morning at 1030. 10 o'clock, 10.30, 10.30, that's here at the church, or at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. That's 10, 10 o'clock, thank you. Uh, so ladies, you have two opportunities to be a part of that Bible study. Men, unfortunately, it's just one night, Wednesday night, uh, 7 o'clock. It's all of, all of those Bible studies here at the church. Uh, join us next Sunday for our 4th of July service. You definitely want to invite people to church on, on 4th of July because it's, it's, amen, because it, it celebrates our country's independence. So do you want to be a part of that? Amen. Next, next week. Um, stay connected with us online with, via Facebook, YouTube, our website, bfchurch.com. With that being said, when you, if you have Facebook and you see a uh, post that we put out throughout the week, be sure to share that and like that. Like it because it becomes part of your feed. Share it so that other your friend you're in your group your friends can see it that's you, so for some of them for some of our friends that's the only time they see Jesus is through us and and so we want to be sure to share that and have that opportunity just to spread God's word a different through different platforms amen uh, don't for and uh, for our guests and online viewers again if you're joining us for the first time uh, if I'd ask you to fill out the welcome card, which we spoke about earlier. Uh, and at the end of the service, we would like the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. In order to redeem that free gift, you need to have your welcome card signed or filled out uh, so that we can get that to you. Again, it's to my left as you exit. For those joining us online, be sure to go to our website, beupchurch.com, and click, click uh, finish. Click on the guest tab and complete that short survey. We will get in contact with you. If you have any questions about the church, you can do that as well. Don't forget your tithes and offerings, three ways to give online, in person, or you could drop it off in the church, on the church, at the church. I'll get one of those prepositions, right? Uh, at the church, um, Monday through Thursday. With that being said, don't forget we have youth and children's tonight at 515. With that being said, you are dismissed. Thank mm -hmm. you.